What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. As always, it's your boy Nick. Big dogs, gotta eat. We're talking fantasy football. We're back with our weekly videos, man. I'm sorry I didn't get one out to you. Last week, I got the blog post in. Man, the shade was real. I missed one goddamn week and everyone's yelling at me. Everyone's mad at me. They're gonna unsubscribe. They hate me. They'd rather kill me than watch me again. I'm like, Zam. That's why I'm wearing that bandana because I feel like I'm going into war right now. Anyways, we're back. It's the regularly scheduled fantasy football content programming back here at Big Dog's Gotta Eat. You know what? Give me a thumbs up on this video if you missed my weekly videos. I know last week I did the blog. Two weeks ago I did the mock draft for 2018, I guess you could say. But yeah, give me that thumbs up if you missed it so that I know that you guys even care, that you guys did miss it, that I'll keep doing these throughout the rest of the season. Do that real quick for me. Scroll down, hit that little thumbs up button. You know what? I'm ready to get right into it. We're talking about key injuries. We're talking about love-hate. Guys, I love this week. Guys, I hate this week. I'm talking about a few different buy low candidates. I got three guys on the list for you. We're going over my fantasy league recaps. We're going over my locks of the century for y'all gambling folks so let's get right into it as we always start off we're hitting the injuries first See what's cracking over here, no pun intended. We're gonna start with my boy Devonta Freeman. This one hurt the soul a little bit to see him get concussed again. It is the second concussion of the season for the little guy. He is expected to miss week 11 at Seattle. Tevin Coleman is now in line for a monster, monster, monster workload. He racked up 86 yards and a touchdown last week against Dallas when Freeman left the game with the injury. Now I was looking back and I'm looking at Tevin Coleman, right? Do we have any instances of Freeman sitting out while Coleman's the only running back there? We basically have one, right? Coleman came in the league in 2015. In that stretch, we have one game where Coleman suited up and Freeman was inactive. In that game, Coleman had 18 carries, racked up like 110 rushing yards. Um, so that's, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see a very, very similar workload, right? Those two are probably, if not the, one of the best running back tandems in the league. The Falcons really know how to use both of those guys. A great timeshare, they're both productive in that. Now with Freeman out, Coleman's gonna be a really, really, really good play this week. Feature back there. I'm looking at the numbers of on the year, right? Freeman sitting at running back 14, Coleman sitting at running back 17. If you combine their numbers, right? If you combine Coleman and Freeman's numbers into one running back on the year, they are on pace for 2,230 total yards, 16 total touchdowns, and 64 receptions. Now, I didn't go back and look at that, but that would easily put them within the top two or three running backs last year. So when you split that on a game by game basis, right, you're getting one of the best running back, one of the best backfields in the league. With Freeman out, Coleman should see a ton of volume and a ton of production there. I don't really care about the matchup. I don't care that they're playing at Seattle. They could be playing against Seattle and Denver, 22 guys on the field. I'm putting Coleman in my lineup no matter what. If either of these guys is injured, you want the other Atlanta running back in your lineup. Terran Ward is the backup to Coleman. He got nine carries last week against Dallas. That was much to do with the game script how Atlanta was smacking that Dallas ass. So they obviously had to, you know, run the ball a lot, get more carries going, and a lot of those went to Terran Ward. So he will be the backup. If you're really desperate, I mean, I've had, I'm in a couple 14-team leagues, so I've been desperate at running back. If you're very desperate in the bye weeks and you're looking for, uh, like, a deep flex play, Terran Ward, you know, you could do worse than Terran Ward. He should get, like, 8 to 12 touches this week. Don Freeman also expected back by week 12. So we'll move along. We have Rob Kelly, High ankle sprain, sprained MCL, placed on the IR. He's gone for the year. That leaves Chris Thompson and Samaj P. Ryan, the rookie, in the backfield. Chris Thompson is going to continue to be the lead back. They're never going to use him as that featured running back here in Washington, right? And it makes sense for like from a football standpoint. Well, first I want to say people are like, oh, Thompson needs to get more playing time. One, there's only been two weeks this year. That's week one and week three, and they didn't really know what they had in the backfield yet, that Chris Thompson didn't lead the backfield in snaps. He's been the snap leader in almost every week. After week three, he's led the backfield in snaps every single week. But you look at him, right? He's like 5'8", 5 5'9", 5 190 pounds. He is a small dude. And from an NFL standpoint, right, Washington is competing for a playoff spot. They might, I don't know, they might be out of the picture right now. I'm not exactly sure. But they're definitely still in competition for uh, like a, a wild card matchup. If Chris Thompson were to get hurt, think about what they have in this backfield. It would just be Samaj P. Ryan. They'd have to call up someone from the practice squad or use, I forget who the fourth string guy on the team is, but that kills any diversity they have in that backfield. So them limiting him in terms of touches is smart. I get it. Like they should definitely be 
if there are games where he's getting like seven to eight touches, you need to increase that. But for him to get like 20 to 25 touches a game is a little crazy. We do have a little bit of a sample size in games that Rob Kelly was out. There was two games this year that Rob Kelly was out. In those games where uh, he was out, Chris Thompson played. He averaged 12 rushing attempts and six targets, five receptions. So he's averaging 17 touches in the two games that Rob Kelly was out. Now, there's also three games where Samaje P. Ryan was out. And in those games, Chris Thompson only averaged 4.6 carries and 6.3 targets. So a lot less volume for Chris Thompson when it was P. Ryan missing as opposed to when Rob Kelly was missing. What that tells me is... They, the Washington coaching staff or, you know, Jay Gruden or whoever it is that's calling the plays and putting the personnel in trusts Rob Kelly a lot more than he trusts Samaj P. Ryan. So when P. Ryan's out, it's no difference for Thompson, right? He's still getting that kind of lower workload. When Kelly's out, they trust Thompson just as much as they trust P. Ryan to run the ball, right? And, uh, and that's what we're probably going to see down the stretch. A lot of Chris Thompson. We're also going to see a lot of Samaj P. Ryan. I look back at, you know, Kelly's been dinged up a lot this year. So there's four games in total, basically, that Rob Kelly has either missed completely, which is two games, or left early with injury. So we have four game sample size, basically, where P. Ryan became the guy, either from the start or by default because of injury. P. Ryan averaged 16 touches in those four games. So in my opinion, both of them are going to eat, right? P. Ryan, I think P. Ryan's actually a sneaky play. Like, I would rather own P. Ryan than Jamal Williams rest of season. Uh, P. Ryan's basically guaranteed a nice 13, 14 touch plus workload, depending on game script as well. He's shown over the last uh, few weeks, his play time, that he can catch the ball, right? He's making plays out of the backfield as a receiver. What else do we got here? Rob Kelly is tied for 11th in the NFL in rushes inside the five yard line of the opponent. He has six rushes inside the five yard line and he's missed two games. He's top 11. He'd probably be top seven, top eight or something like that had he not missed two games. So that tells me there's a lot of, you know, this is a good offense. It's not a great offense, but it's a good offense with scoring opportunities. Uh, he is going to be the early down guy. He's probably going to be the goal line back there, right? Kirk Cousins has four rushes inside the five yard line. So if you're giving these Rob Kelly looks and maybe half of the, half of the Kirk Cousins sneaks to Samaj P. Ryan, then you're looking at a guy with a lot of scoring opportunity here. So I, I like the fact that he's going to get these looks. I like the fact that he's been showing that he could do something in the passing game as well. P. Ryan is, is a sneaky good flex play, I think, going forward because the volume is there. As for Chris Thompson, he's an easy RB2 no matter what the uh, format is going forward on a week-to-week -week basis. And uh, tons of upside there too. So with Rob Kelly gone, got to like CT Crunch, got to like my boy Samaj P. Ryan. Not my boy. I take that back already immediately. Next, we move to another little shaky backfield. We got... Ty Softgomery and Aaron Jones. Ty Mont's dealing with another rib injury, right? It's a rib injury, a similar rib injury that cost him a game already this year. Aaron Jones dealing with a MCL injury. Oops, sorry, we kind of X'd out there. And he's out there saying three to six weeks. I'm more pessimistic. When they give a, a large time frame table like that, that basically means that they, they really don't know how someone's going to react to the treatment. They don't, they don't really know much, right? Three to six weeks is a large time frame. So for me, that kind of says that um, I'm more pessimistic when it comes to these longer-ish terms of injury. So Aaron Jones, I'm totally fine dropping him unless you have like a really deep roster because one, we usually when you get back from these types of injuries, especially like knee injuries, you're eased back into your workload. And by the time he comes back in a month, they're definitely going to have like their backfield situation somewhat figured out. So he's going to probably enter limited as well as being in a kind of running back by committee there. So, um, so Aaron Jones, yeah, I think he's definitely, definitely droppable. And Ty Montgomery, I would, you know, they, the Packers are saying he has a chance to play this week. Now they get a home game versus Baltimore. I, you know, it, it's anyone's guess as to whether or not he plays. You have to monitor these reports very closely I would say that, you know, when Tymont and Aaron Jones both left the game last week, Jamal Williams operated as the feature back there. Now, Jamal Williams has not been good at all this year, right? Last week, he had 20 carries for 67 yards. That was like, I think I have it written down here somewhere. 3.3 yards a carry. Not good when you do the mathematics. I did them for you. He had one catch for seven yards. So they used him in a featured role. What I do like about week 11 in particular for Jamal Williams, I don't think he's good. I, I'll say that before. I'll say it again on the record. What I do like here is Baltimore has been beat on the ground, right? They've been kind of roller coasterish, right? They've had, they've either kept every 
running back they've gone against, every starting running back they've gone against under 60 yards rushing, but they also have three instances where the running back uh, went over 110 yards rushing, which is Le'Veon, Jordan Howard, Latavius Murray. For the most part, you're seeing teams go very run heavy against Baltimore, and it makes sense because they're on the bottom of the scale when it comes to rushing defense, but they're on the top of the scale when it comes to passing defense, right? They're one of the top pass defenses in the NFL. If you're looking at any category, right? Yards per attempt, passing yards allowed per game. Uh, they lead the NFL in interceptions with 13. They're top of the list in terms of passing yards allowed of 20 plus yards, uh, passing plays of 20 plus yards, passing plays of 40 plus yards. So very good pass, not so good run defense. You would expect Green Bay to obviously without Rodgers there, you're expecting them to kind of approach it the same way, right? And if Jamal Williams is the only running back there, if Ty Montgomery is in fact out for week 11, yeah, I'm okay with Jamal Williams as like a, a low-end RB2 or a flex play. I'm, I'm definitely cool with him being a flex play with uh, with some upside because the volume is going to be so heavy. If Ty Montgomery is playing, man, I don't trust either of these guys. I would say uh, if Ty Mont's playing, if they say he's good to go, I would rather take Ty Mont over Jamal Williams. You know, in his first game back from the rib injury, he had 10 carries and I think a couple of receptions. So they did still use him in a, in a somewhat vo uh, voluminous role. Uh, but you're going to have to keep keep an eye on them. So Jamal Williams, okay, if Tymont's out, I would probably prefer Tymont, especially in like PPR formats, to Jamal if he plays. And another group of running backs. we got CJ Proceis, Eddie Lacy. Proceis has gone with some ligament damage to his ankle. I didn't even really know, like when you look at your ankle, I don't even know if there's like ligaments really going through there. I mean, more like Achilles, but I feel like all I feel is like the bone. That's probably just me being an idiot, but Proceis is gone leaving Eddie Lacy, Thomas Rawls, J.D. McKissick. Eddie Lacy missed week 10 with a groin injury. We haven't had any reports. Actually, I'll check Roto World right now to see if anything kind of came out in the last like hour since I've um, since I've been writing down my notes and whatnot. If Eddie Lacy is out, that would leave just McKissick and Thomas Rawls there in the backfield against the Atlanta Falcons in week 10 at home. Now, I love McKissick this week, as I'll talk about more in guys I love this week. If Lacy sits... That will obviously give a boost to McKissick in terms of volumes of touches in the in the run game, right? He's not really being used in the run game, like three to five attempts a game. I think that'll give him an extra like two to three carries if Eddie Lacy is out. Rawls will obviously be like the early down kind of guy there. Although, you know, with Proceis out, this, this leaves McKissick as the unquestioned third down back, right? The pass catching back in this offense. First, I want to say RIP to the GOAT, Chris Carson. Take a moment of silence. He still leads the Seattle backfield in total yards. Still. Remember when that injury happened? That was like eight weeks ago. He still leads his backfield in total yards. Makes no sense. I mean, it makes tons of sense because he's the GOAT and they all suck. McKissick leads the backfield in targets, receptions, receiving yards, and is tied for receiving touchdown lead with, uh, I think he has the actually the lead total touchdowns. I think he has two touchdowns and no one else has more than one. So he's leading them in total touchdowns as well. He is averaging 4.4 yards per carry. 10 yards per reception, which is among running 52 running backs with at least 10 receptions, that's 13th. So he's in the top 20, 25 percentile in terms of yards per reception. He's making plays when they're throwing him the ball. Seattle backfield is only averaging five and a half targets a game, but almost all of them will be McKissick's now. He out, uh, last week Rawls out snapped him 29 to 20, but that was very close. And that was despite them leading most of the game. So it's not like game script was, um, you know, and that's not like they were getting killed, and it's not like they, they preferred the pass catching back there. They just used McKissick almost as much as they used Thomas Rawls. When you look at Atlanta on the other side of the ball, they are not good against pass catching backs. Never have. They haven't been in the last, like, three years, and they still aren't. They are allowing the most receptions to the running back position this year. They're allowing 6.6 .6 receptions a game to the running back position. They're also allowing the fourth most targets to the running back position, and the fourth most receiving touchdowns to the running back position. So for me, this is like a perfect storm for J.D. McKissick. Lacey out, maybe. We have to wait on reports. But if Lacey's out, Proceis is already out, this could be a very, very, very good play for McKissick in PPR leagues especially. So, I mean, even if Lacey's in, McKissick is their third down back. So I, I like him as a, as a nice PPR floor play, probably for four to five receptions, and he should get a little bit, of, a little bit more rushing workloads. So. And as you should know by now, my wide receiver cornerback notable matchup sheet for the week comes out on Thursday, usually around like noonish. If you want to get notified when that comes out, head over to my website, bdgeat.com, 
All you got to do is go to the homepage, scroll down, put your info in down here, and every Thursday when it releases, you'll get an email. It's a quick read, probably 10 minutes, and it kind of outlines any of the bigger mismatches I see throughout the week. It'll tell you who's supposed to receive shadow coverage. It'll tell you... I don't know, a bunch of good random other stats and facts and stuff that'll help you kind of prepare for your wide receiver slots in your fantasy lineup. So make sure you are subscribed to the newsletter. And if you are, then you don't got to worry about a damn thing. So hopefully you guys signed up for the newsletter there. If you didn't, I'll give you another second. Okay, let's move on to guys I love this week. We'll start off the quarterbacks. First up, Alex Smith. I'm looking at the numbers, and you can see all these right on Yahoo when you go to like the player, the waiver wire page. Click the little drop down and hit research, and it tells you who, how a percentage owned, percentage started. Alex Smith is only being started right now in 48% of Yahoo leagues. Y'all are so disrespectful to Alex Smith. Going against the New York Giants. Y'all know what that means? It's the New York Giants. Probably the worst team in the NFL right now. Actually, mm, Cleveland Browns are pretty goddamn bad, but mm, the Giants are... You know, they're on the same playing field, I'd say. He's been so good this year, Alex Smith. People are down on him right now. I feel like it's all because he threw for one touchdown, like, last week or two weeks ago, whenever it was, instead of fucking four that he's usually been putting up. Now he gets the best matchup he possibly could have had. You have no choice but to like him. The Giants are allowing the most fantasy points to the quarterback position in 2017. The team is in full disarray. Their pass defense is straight trash. Like, awful. I'm talking about, like, they're in disarray, man. I'm talking, like... Drinking Henny like I'm Kenny Lofton, like at halftime. I feel like some of them might be drinking Henny at halftime. That's how they're playing when they come out in the second half. They get whooped by C.J. Bethard, Bethard, whose man's is this anyways? 26 fantasy points against the Giants last week. C.J. Bethard. That's how much I don't even know. I don't even know how to say his name. That's how much he shouldn't be scoring 26 points against you in fantasy. But he did. Now they get Alex Smith, the QB4 in fantasy football this year. He has an 18 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio this year. He's on pace to. He, I can't even. That's how excited I am right now. I can't even like talk normal. He's on pace to smash career highs in both passing yards by 843 and passing touchdowns by nine. I'm sorry he's only thrown for like 460 yards and three touchdowns over the last two games. Sorry he hasn't given you 28 fantasy points in each of the last two games. But one of those games was against Denver. So, like, you got to chill. He's still putting up fine numbers. He's going to destroy the Giants' pass defense this year. So, if you're a part of the 52% that are not starting him this week, shame on you. Shame on you. Next quarterback, Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan. Now, I don't I'm not going to necessarily say I love Matt Ryan this week, but I think a lot more people are going to be scared off by him because they see that little at Seattle next to his name. You know what happened the last time Matt Ryan played at Seattle? It was last year. I think it was week five or week six. He threw four, 335 yards, three touchdowns. And that was with Richard Sherman. I think it was with Earl Thomas. I'll have to double check that. You know, Matt Ryan started off slow. He had, from weeks one to seven, he only had one game with multiple passing touchdowns. Since then, three straight games with at least two touchdowns through the air. He's getting hot. Things are starting to heat up. They're turning up. Turn up, never turn down. Shout out Big Al. And uh, now he gets to travel to Seattle, which is not like the best place to play. But they lost Richard Sherman. Uh, Earl Thomas has been out since week eight with a little hamstring injury. Pete Carroll says that he should return this week. But Pete Carroll's word is probably as good as Donald Trump's word. So, I mean, we're just going to have to wait on reports when it comes to Earl Thomas. If Earl Thomas is out, that's just another huge boost to this pass offense for Atlanta, right? They don't have Devonta Freeman. They might have to lean on Matt Ryan a little bit more. And uh, without Richard Sherman, without possibly Earl Thomas, you know, they're not as strong as a defense as as most people will expect them to be, right? Um, last week, Drew Stanton put up 273 yards and a touchdown against the Seattle defense. Matt Ryan, he's top eight in passing yards this year uh, at the quarterback position. Like I said, he destroyed Seattle last year when they played him. Without Richard Sherman, Julio Jones, I mean, this is basically can be said every single week and he's yet to really blow up, but he went seven for 139 in a touchdown last year in that game against Seattle. This year, they're going to be without Sherman, so look for him to, 
You know, just give him fucking eight targets, Matt Ryan. God damn it. This Atlanta offense is so frustrating to watch as a fan. Give him eight to ten targets. I guarantee you he throws up a seven for 120 and a touchdown this week. So I look for them to do that. A couple of weeks ago, they let up 400 yards and four touchdowns to Deshaun Watson. I mean, this is not a defense that can't be beat, especially without some of their key players in the game. So basically, I, like I said, I'm not like in love with Matt Ryan. I'm not, he's not like a top three option for me. But I just don't think you should be scared away just because that little at Seattle symbol next to his name. And uh, since we're talking about guys I love and we're talking about Atlanta, I kind of already went over these two. My two running backs that I really like this week are J.D. McKissick and Tevin Coleman. I talked about them in the injury section. McKissick with Proceise out should just get a lot of lot of receiving work, a little bit of boost in volume if Eddie Lacy's out. Atlanta's just letting up the most running back receptions. Two opposing running backs should be, you know, it should be a good opportunity for McKissick to have a really, really, really strong game. Tevin Coleman, obviously, uh, I think he's only being started in like 58% of leagues right now. So I'm sure that will kind of increase as as more people set their lineups throughout the week. But with, uh, with Devonta Freeman out, he is an absolute must start. Wide receivers, I'll talk about that in my wide receiver cornerback matchup uh, blog sheet that comes out tomorrow. Wow, at this time, tomorrow, well, tomorrow, next week. This doesn't even make sense. Today's Wednesday. I'm filming this Wednesday. Next week on Thursday, it's on Thanksgiving Day. I'll be in, I'll be on my way to the airport, on my way to San Diego. Oh, that means I have to get my video out again on Wednesday next week. Ooh, it's gonna be a busy ass week. All right, so yeah, I'll be in San Diego next Thursday, baby. Staying out there for, actually, I don't even have a return ticket, so probably like three and a half weeks to a month. Things go really, really well out there. Who knows? Maybe I'll be back in like a year or so. Don't don't fret though. I'm still gonna be coming at you. you know, we grind over here at the. We're gonna have a new HQ though. I guess a new Big Dogs HQ. That's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. I'm going out to San Diego, right? I'm going to crash with my friend. I'm going to crash in his apartment, which is not even like an apartment. It's like a. It's almost like a house. It's him, two of his roommates. They're in the Marines, so they're always traveling and getting called out to the field, and they go to the field, whatever that even means, for like weeks at a time. So while I'm there, I'm planning on staying there for like a month. While I'm there, they're gone from, I know he's gone from December 3rd to like the 12th, him and his roommate. So I'm going to have like the entire apartment for myself for like 10 to 11 days, and uh, I have no idea what I'm going to do out there. I'm just going to be like alone in San Diego. I mean, there's probably, actually, that probably sounds like the best time ever i'm super excited for it actually I, got, I don't even know why i'm like splurging i don't even know what i'm talking about right now my friends two of my friends work at iheart radio in new york city they're doing they like they run z100 they got the jingle ball tour going nationwide right now starting like next week i think and they actually head out to la while i'm in cal in san diego so they're hooking me up these two girls i'm friends with work there and they're hooking me up with tickets to the concert so i'm gonna meet them out in la i'm gonna bring some hopefully i make enough friends out in san diego by the time that next weekend rolls around so that i could travel to la with them go to the concert that's dope and i was actually invited to this gala this like this ball in uh in nashville on december 3rd to the 5th so i may be going out to san diego going up to la and flying out to nashville for this gala back to san diego for another couple weeks and then home to jersey for the holidays and then after like New Year's I gotta figure out what I wanna do with my life. Low key, I hate to say this to you guys, but I can't wait for football season to kinda wrap up so I can uh I'll have a lot more time to work on my marketing business. So, you know, this takes a lot of time. Anyways, I'm done rambling. I'm really sorry about that. I don't even know what I was getting into. We'll get back to the tight ends, guys that I love this week. We have Jason Witten going against Philadelphia. Last week, first game without Zeke, right? First game without their Tyrone Smith, their left tackle. Dak was on the run for his life, had to settle for a lot of checkdowns, had to settle for a lot of um, short passes. Witten caught seven of seven targets, 59 yards, a really, really good PPR play. Uh, Philly has been beat by tight ends this year. They're allowing the eighth most fantasy points to the position. That whole NFC East is just a tight end attack. Right, the Giants are awful. Washington is not good. Philly's not good. Dallas is just not a great pass defense overall. So anytime there's like an NFC East matchup, you could play the tight ends there. Ooh, sorry, yeah. So Jason Witten, I really like uh, with Zeke out. Dez kind of banged up. You know, Dak kind of Dak was forced to check down. Over under 48 points in this game. Potential to be a shootout. A lot of these NFC East games do end up being a shootout. So I like that, and I like Jason Witten as a nice little uh, 
Nice little streamer if he's available in your league. Second guy I love at tight end, Jared Cook. Coming on very, 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 very strong as of late. He's averaging six catches a game over their last three games. He's gone over 100 receiving yards in two of those three games. Becoming a bigger and bigger piece of this offense, right? You have Derek Carr, who's banged up in the middle of the year. He's getting healthier and healthier as the weeks go by. Now coming off the bye week, he basically should be fully healthy, right? He should be at full strength, 100% healthy. I like Cook to contribute again big this week. The thing I like the most about the matchup this week with the Patriots, besides they have the highest over-under of the week at 52 and a half, so another, another game with a really big uh, possibility of a shootout, 52 and a half, highest of all the NFL games this week, is the fact, you know, the Patriots, right? Uncle Bill, what's he do best? He takes away the best part of the opponent's offense. So you look at Oakland, what is that? It definitely ain't the run game. It's their outside receivers, Amari Cooper, Michael Crabtree. They will look to kind of shut those guys down, if not just focus on one of them, right? So I think that will leave a lot of the middle of the field open for Jared Cook to run, a, to kind of run, run rampant against this, uh, against this defense. Now, New England's been a lot better over the last month of the season, especially in terms of defensively. They were god-awful at the beginning of the year. They were getting murdered by tight ends, but they've been a lot better over, over the last month. Um, but I do still think this is a very good situation, given what I just said for Jared Cook. So those are the guys I love this week, right? The guys I hate this week. Guys, I hate this week. A lot of these guys are not going to be popular picks by you guys. You guys are going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about, bruh? And uh, first up is a quarterback I do not like this week is Jared Goff. Now, he's been lighting up the scoreboard for me these last two weeks. He gets a much harder matchup this week. He's playing at Minnesota. The last two games he played, New York Giants, Houston Texans. Very, very possibly the two worst pass defenses in the NFL. He couldn't have had a better situation. He couldn't have had a better two weeks. And he took advantage of them, right? All credit to him. Had like 660 passing yards, seven passing touchdowns in the last two weeks. Absolutely exploded. Looked amazing. This Rams team just looks incredible. Now, they're playing Minnesota. One of the best pass defenses in the NFL. When I look at Minnesota, they they do a few things well on, on, on the defense. Well, first of all, they have Xavier Rhodes, obviously, who is basically a lockdown cornerback. Jared Goff, right? A lot of his a lot of his production, a lot of his big games, a lot of his passing yardage comes from these really long plays, whether it's deep shots down the field to Robert Woods or screens or dump offs to Todd Gurley and he takes it for 45 plus yards. Minnesota does not allow big plays on the defensive side of the ball. They are tied for the second fewest 20 plus yard passing plays and 40 plus yard passing plays allowed in the NFL. So they don't let teams, you know, work the ball down the field. They don't get beat by 20-yard plays. They don't get beat by 40-yard plays. And that is where the Rams kind of excel on offense, right? He's always hitting um, these big plays to his outside receivers and a lot of these dump-offs and screens. So I think Minnesota takes that kind of, that piece away from their offense and Goff is probably going to struggle. For as good as Goff has been this year, you got to look at these splits. And these are Goff versus First of all, we'll start off with top 15 passing defenses. These are just like the top half. So these are just the top half in the NFL. You see how dramatic the split is there. He takes advantage of his bad matchups. Not so good against the good matchups. He's on the road. That's certainly not going to help him. When you dig even deeper, you look at Goff against top nine passing defenses in the NFL. The top half of passing defenses. Now we get to like, I would say top nine is, is basically elite, right? You're on the top third or the top fourth of the NFL. And Minnesota can definitely be considered top eight, top nine here. And uh, the numbers get pretty bad here. As, as impressive as the Rams have been and as good as Goff has been this year, I think he's very much going to struggle in this game. Uh, you know, they, they, they lead the league in passing. I mean, in scoring, right? They're averaging like 33 points a game. Vegas has them pinned. They're projected to score just 22 points this game. So Vegas expects them to struggle. Come down to the mean of where, you know, a normal offense would probably be against this Minnesota defense. And I think that leads to Jared Goff struggling a lot. So I'm a little nervous. I, it's a bump down for Goff. I mean, obviously, if you have no other options, if you're in like a 14 or 16 team league, go with Goff if you have nothing better. But um, but I'm a little low on him this week. Now, this one is just going to be like, everyone's going to be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? One guy I do not like this week, Leonard Fournette. Going against Cleveland, 95% started right now. This will not be a popular pick. And I know almost nobody has the luxury to sit a guy like Leonard Fournette. I understand that. So you're probably going to play him. But hear me out. I, I would say, I guess it's more so for DFS guys. And for me to just be like, I told y'all motherfuckers when the week is done. Hear me out. Leonard Fournette. He's coming off the worst game of his season, right? Uh, he ran for like 35 yards and 17. Something really bad. Some terrible yards per carry. 
He outsnapped Yeldon just 45 to 31. Right now, the Jags, you know, they promoted Yeldon over Chris Ivory. They see him as the clear pass catching back there. He's playing on a lot of third downs, and it wasn't like the game script got away from them. They, they won against the Chargers. So um, Yeldon was seeing a lot of the field, even though Fournette was still getting his volume. What makes me more nervous, though, is this Browns defense. Yes, I said the Browns defense. They are right now the number one run defense in the NFL. They're allowing 3.1 yards per carry. The number That's the number one in the NFL. What's even scarier is how they perform when they're at home. And this is a home game. It's Jacksonville at Cleveland. I want you to listen to this. Listen to these statistics. Listen to these numbers carefully. They've had five home games this year. Cleveland has had five home games this year. The running backs they've gone against in those home games. It was Le'Veon Bell. Then it was the combination of Joe Mixon and Gio. Combination of Blau Powell and Elijah McGuire. Um, DeMarco Murray and Derrick Henry. And McKinnon and Latavius Murray. Those five games. Now, of Le'Veon Bell and those other four combos that I just named, in those five games, they've combined for 260 rushing yards on 107 attempts. That's 2.4 yards per carry. And they've allowed just one rushing score to those nine different running backs, the four combos and Bell. They are like an elite, elite, elite rush defense when they're at home. So, Despite them being seven and a half point favorites, the Jaguars are probably going to need to rely more on Blake Bortles this game, right? The Browns are sitting there 0 9. They are the laughing stock of the NFL, depending on whether or not you're a Giants fan. They're due for an upset, man. Hugh ain't going to let them go off winless. They're due for an upset. All they've been hearing about is how good this Jags team is. They're elite. They're the best. They ground and pound you. They're going to bully you, intimidate you. You're not going to be able to move the ball on offense. I think this is like the perfect setup for the, to the, for the Browns to, um, this is a trap game, right? They're going to fight fire with fire. The Jaguars are like, we're going to use our best offensive weapon against you, Fournette. Cleveland's like, no, nah, we're going to use our best defensive asset, and that's our run defense. We're going to hit you at the line of scrimmage. We're going to hit you hard, and we're going to stop you at the line of scrimmage, right? I just think that they're going to stop Fournette there, and they're going to make Blake Bortles beat them um, in this game. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say I think they come away with the upset, but as I'll talk about my locks of the century, I don't hate I don't hate Cleveland getting seven and a half points here at home, man. I don't hate it. So Leonard Fournette, I ain't that high in him this week. Adrian Peterson is running back number two of guys I don't like. 60% started playing at Houston. So we have four games of Adrian Peterson as the feature back there, right? A four game sample size. Two of those games, he's gone over 130 rushing yards. The other two games, he's gone under 30 rushing yards. What do we? What can we get from that? We know that when he plays good teams, good rush defenses, he's not good. When he plays bad teams, he's very good. When you're looking at Houston, for as bad as they've been as a pass defense, they are very, 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 very strong against the run. They are allowing the second fewest fantasy points to opposing running backs on the year despite losing J.J. Watt and all those injuries they've had on defense, right? Adrian Peterson, like 58 years old, coming off two weeks of a combined 61 touches. How does the body respond to that? Clearly, it didn't respond well. Last week, they gave him another 20-plus touches. We'll see if he can, you know, get back to, to him being his old self, but I'd bet against it, right? Now they're traveling to Houston against a good run D. You know, following week one, where they let up 100 yards to Leonard Fournette on, like, 26 carries— They've only allowed one running back to surpass 70 rushing yards. And that was Kareem Hunt in like week five or six. He, he rushed for 107 yards, but he needed 29 carries to do it. So he wasn't efficient. He just got the volume here. The Cardinals just lost their left tackle, DJ Humphreys, and they're back to being one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL, right? Adrian Peterson made them look good again for a couple games, but when it, all, you know, when it gets down to the nitty gritty, when you get in the trenches, they're not a good offensive line. They still have Drew Stanton as their quarterback. Teams will stack the box against him no matter how many carries you give AP. He's going to get hit. So... The good news is obviously the volume, right? He's seen 20 carries in like three or four games since this, since being traded to Arizona. Could be in line for another big workload. I'm not confident with him in my lineup as anything more than like a flex play this week. So uh, just be weary of Adrian Peterson. I could see him getting like 18 carries for like 55 yards or 64 yards or some shit like that. So yeah, someone just texted me and said, quotations, songs that get drunk white girls excited. Spotify playlist reminds me of you. 
know, I always wondered if I asked my friends, I was like, yo, if you could describe me in like five words or like five phrases or five characteristics, you know, how, what, what would you say about me? Like, how would you describe me? I feel like that's like what most of them would uh, say. Something like that. Jesus, Johnny Manziel looks like shit. Can you see that? Oh no, it's, what the f***? Man, Instagram's always fucking. Johnny motherf in football. Guy looks good. Honestly, he looks like about 90% of starting quarterbacks in the NFL. Looks like Eli Manning. Caption Johnny Meatball. Love that. Love that. So where, where even was I? I forget. Oh, I was talking about spot. Yeah. If my friends could describe me, they'd probably tell me I was, if I was a Spotify playlist, my name would be songs that get drunk white girls excited. I'm actually not really that mad about that. Anyways, those are three guys that I hate this week. Whatever. Get over it. Move on. I'm talking about buy low candidates now. Now, a lot of you guys, the, the Yahoo fantasy football platform, their, their normal trade deadline was November 11th. So it was last Saturday. So a lot of you guys probably can't even trade anymore. But for the people that, you know, if the commissioner for a different website or something has something different, here are a couple buy low candidates I really like going forward. The first is Corey Davis. Coming off season high, 10 targets, right? He's, he's slowly becoming the wide receiver one there. I'm not surprised. He's the number five overall pick. Stupid talented. Stupid talented. Um, he's finally getting the snap counts. He played in as many snaps as Rashard Matthews last week. It was like 87% of the team's snaps. He was, you know, he's ready to put himself on the map, and he was about an inch away from doing so last week. He reached out for the pile on the ball got loose. So rather than a touchdown, it was a touchback. That's honestly good for people that are trying to buy low because when you look at the fantasy numbers, it doesn't look like he's done much. But the volume's there. And now he gets Pittsburgh, a very, very good pass defense. So um, they're allowing the third fewest fantasy points to opposing wide receivers. So I wouldn't expect a big game. I'd expect kind of a mediocre game from Corey Davis. What I would do if I were you, or if you have the luxury or the time, maybe wait until after Corey Davis plays against Pittsburgh, has a mediocre game, and then try to buy him. Because after Pittsburgh, they get Indy, Houston, Arizona, San Fran. You can't get a better lineup of fantasy matchups if you're a wide receiver. You gon' you gon' eat. I'm gonna I'm gonna get I'm gonna get him got before I get got. Marshawn Lynch said it best. I think he was talking about Corey Davis over the last stretch of the season. Now he gets these juicy ass matchups. He's gonna put up at least two, if not three, really, really, really strong fantasy performances in those four games, I would bet. So Corey Davis, buy low. Josh Doxson, another young receiver I like. Now, he also can't put it together, but it seems like every game he's either scoring a touchdown or he should have scored a touchdown, right? Kirk Cousins overthrows him. He gets three end zone targets. He, he's just constantly being used there, and now Terrell Pryor is basically phased out of this offense entirely. He didn't have a single catch last week. Doxson had a season high, seven targets, so he's becoming more and more of a player in this offense. He went up against Xavier Rhodes. Now, Xavier Rhodes basically shattered him, which tells you what the opponents, what other teams, other cornerbacks think about Doxson. And they think he's probably the best wide receiver on this Washington team. So Doxson, the more he gets involved, the more this offense kind of keeps rolling, he should, you know, continue to see targets in, in the six to eight range. Um, he sh he's going to continue getting those end zone targets, especially if Jordan Reed is out. Um now, the next six weeks, as we're going to the end of the fantasy season, are filled with either really good or really bad matchups, right? He gets New Orleans, Marshawn Lattimore, you don't want to play him. Uh, the Chargers, Casey Hayward, and then Denver, Tlaib. So those are tough, but he also gets the Giants. He also gets Arizona. He also gets Dallas. So, um, you know, you know if you can get him, you know when to play him, you know when not to play him. And that's that's actually a good thing, right, in retrospect. So I like Josh Doxson. I like Corey Davis way more, but I like Josh Doxson too. And the last one I really like, because I'm getting a ton of questions about him, and I think given the recent news about Tyrod Taylor being benched for, for the Peterman, the Peterinator, we got Shady, LaShawn McCoy, getting a ton of questions for him. And I think a lot of people might start to devalue Shady now that the benching happened, right? People are going to say, oh, no, Peterman's in the offense. They're not going to move the ball. They're going to struggle. I should probably get rid of Shady. And it makes sense, but I think you're definitely going to see a, an uptick in volume, right? Peterman might be a little hesitant to throw the ball deep. He might have a lot more dump-offs. They're definitely going to rely on the run going forward. But what I like more, is his rest of season is incredible. This is from Week 11 to Week 16, Shady's schedule. Every single game is against a bad rush defense. Now, in that first column, you see like the fantasy points allowed to running backs. That three means that they've the, the Chargers have given up the third most fantasy points to opposing running backs. 
When you look at the yards per carry, the best team they're playing against is Indy, who's ranked 15th in the NFL in yards per carry. Otherwise, they're all bottom 25. These are just great, 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 great matchups. None of them are strong. Uh, real life rush defenses, and they're all giving up a ton, ton of points to fantasy running back. So Shady has probably the easiest schedule for a fantasy running back down the stretch, and he's someone that if owners are looking to move on or move on from, then I would scoop Shady because you, you just can't get a better lineup than that. And that wraps up, you know, all the analysis I guess I'm going to give you this week. But if you want to stick around, I got my league recaps. I got my locks of the century. If you don't, scroll down and give it a little thumbs up for me, please. I would very much appreciate that. If you're new to the channel, subscribe to the channel because we do this every week. And I, I do my live streams every Sunday morning from like usually like 11.15 to 1 o'clock. We do sit starts. We talk about our Saturday nights, how they were, how we've been, how you during, all that kind of stuff. Uh, make sure you have notifications turned on for YouTube so you know when I go live. And you follow me on Twitter because I put a notification up for there. My league recaps. All right, I'll get right down to the nitty gritty. E-Town get down, four and six. We're sitting in eighth place. Not good. Two weeks ago, I threw up a 170 spot, got a dub. Last week, I threw up like a 135, I think it was. I didn't even check the final score because the guy I played against scored like 175. So it was like one of those where you would have beat any other team had you not played this one guy. And that's what happened. So uh, lost. I would have had a lot of mojo coming into this week. Four and six. I'm still two games out of that fourth place spot. So anything could happen down the stretch. But I mean, listen, so far this year, I've lost to Sean Watson, uh, OBJ, Allen Robinson, Chris Carson, Danny Woodhead. Uh, I've just been ravaged with injuries. So it's not, I mean, I don't want to make excuses, but there's not a lot I could do there when, when a lot of my, you know, my, my key players just keep going down with injuries. So a lot of, a lot of luck there. Um, but it is what it is. So I'm just fighting out to get the last place spot right now. I don't, I don't think I should, but, but next we have my college friends league. I have the most points scored in my league, but I'm still sitting at five and five. Again, it's just unlucky. It's just bad timing on who I played. The most points in the league sitting at five and five, sixth place, four teams get in the playoffs. So I think, I mean, look at my team. My team is incredible in this league. Look at my running backs, Ingram, Le'Veon Bell. I got Gronk, uh, Funches, Corey Davis, Amari Cooper, Tyreek Hill, Fitzgerald. Like even my bench is stacked up right there. Depth is there. I, I, I should continue winning this league and get into the playoffs. And I, I, I'm about to run train on the playoffs there. Subscriber league, man, I'm just getting washed to be honest. I'm four and six, should be five and five. I, was, I talk about this every single week. I'll probably never, never get over it. I played OBJ in the first week by accident when he wasn't even playing. I lost by 0.3 points. I mean, I can still go on a run. I'm two games out of sixth place and this is a 14 team league. Um, so I could sneak in there still. And uh, you know, when, I mean, I, I had uh, Odell Beckham was my first rounder. And what sucks is like when you're in a 14 team league, you only get like one or two of those like haymaker kind of guys, like an OBJ. So if you lose them, like I did, it's very hard to come back from that because you're, it's hard to pick someone up who's going to put up the, that kind of production in a really, really big league because the waiver wire is scarce. But anyway, you know, props to everyone raking in that league. I forget. I don't even know who's the top four guys, but hopefully you're still watching my videos. Some of you guys still got to pay up, by the way. $10 buy-in. I, I don't think I'm not going to follow up on that shit. Last league I'm in is the Fantasy Jocks Office League. If you need any equipment for your fantasy football league, I'm talking about belts, trophies, rings. As the playoffs are coming up, I know you want to sport some hot shit. It's only fake if you don't have something to play for. I have my affiliate code down below. You can use, I think it's Take 10. I think, the pro, I think the promo code is TAKE10, 10 10% off. Go through my affiliate link in the description below. Go get yourself, go get your league something nice from the website. I'm sitting in sixth place. Again, it's a 14-team league, so I am in the playoffs as of right now. I mean, the 14-team leagues are tough, I got to say, but I made two huge pickups on the waiver wire this week. I got Alex Smith, and I got Samaj P. Ryan. I know that might not sound exciting, but I have Russell Wilson as my starting quarterback, but Tyrod was my backup, and obviously now he's benched, so... I got Alex Smith, and the guy I'm playing against only had Cam Newton, who's on a buy. So I'm assuming I saved a lot of my fab budget, and then I blew it, like most of it this week, on Smith and P. Ryan. He was definitely going all in on Alex Smith to, you know, to play over Cam Newton now that he's a buy. Grabbed him from him. P. Ryan, I know a lot of you guys probably are not excited about him as I am, but this is a sharp league. And when you're in a 14-team league, running backs are they're hard to get on the wire, man. You gotta really, you really gotta go in deep on them. So I'm, I'm pumped up. I got some AJP Ryan. Like the next best back I could have got off the wire was like Corey Clement. So that was big for me. And uh, someone actually also just dropped JD McKissick. So I'm gonna try to get him next time. Though next time the waiver wire processes, as I was saying before my battery died. Um, but again, guys, we're in the final stretch, right? You could still rattle off like three or four wins in a row 
and get into those playoffs. So don't give up even if you're in eighth place, if you're in seventh place, if you're in 10th place, just keep on grinding. Keep on moving, keep on rolling, keep on cruising. Like they say in Biodome, man. That's my league recaps. So we'll get to the locks of the century. The final, final piece of this video. Again, thumb it up if you're enjoying. These videos get me so out of breath, man. Locks of the century. I haven't done this since week eight. We're sitting at 11 and 12 on the season. I was uh, two and one in week eight. Move to week 11. I have four picks actually for this week. First off is Cleveland plus seven and a half. At home versus Jacksonville, I already told you I kind of like Cleveland this week. I just like the storyline of the game more than I actually like the Browns team. So we're going seven and a half. They're getting a touchdown and a half with the hook. Uh, we got Los Angeles Chargers, minus four at home versus Buffalo. We got Buffalo traveling cross country. They got a midweek quarterback change. I just There's a lot going against them right now. So I like Chargers to kind of handle business there. Minus four, I like that. New England, Oakland, over 52 and a half. Highest over under of the week in the NFL. Uh, I just, I don't think either of these defenses are particularly great. A lot of talent on the field on the offensive side of the ball. I think it turns into a shootout. 52 and a half is pretty high, but I feel like New England just doesn't stop, right? They'll be up like 28 in the fourth quarter and still like throwing deep fades to Gronk. So give me 36 points out of New England and we're gonna hit that over under. And lastly, Dallas versus Philadelphia. I'm taking Dallas at home. Plus three and a half versus Philly. A lot of people are like, wow, Philly's only given three and a half points. I think this is a trap game. I think a lot of the, the public's money is going to be on Philly, right? You see how well they're playing. You see Dallas is not playing well without their without Zeke and without Tyron Smith last, uh, last week. But <clears throat> Philly, prior to this week when they're traveling to Dallas, they haven't left Philadelphia in like 38 calendar days. They've been at home, they've been comfortable, they've been rolling, they've had full weeks of practices, they've had plenty of time between three home games in a row and a bye week, they have not moved. So I think them having to travel on the road for the first time in a while, I think a lot of people are overlooking Dallas right now and they think that, oh, Philly's gonna roll over them. But this, man, these divisional matchups are always super close. I like Dallas to get, uh, to bounce back. You know, Des Bryant's a little healthier. I think, is Smith, um, I think Smith should be back this week. He's uncertain uh, to play in week 11. So Terrence Smith and Sean Lee is, are both questionable. I think Sean Lee's already bas basically been ruled out for like three weeks. So that's a hit. But I mean, like he's never healthy anyways. So um, I don't know. I just like Dallas plus three and a half here. So I don't know if they're going to win the game, but I do like them getting points, getting a field goal in the hook, baby. So uh, that's going to wrap up my week 11 analysis. Again, I'm sorry for missing the last couple weeks, but I hope you enjoyed this one. Again, if you're new, hit that subscribe button because we do this every week. Make sure the notifications are on. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram. Sign up for the newsletter and hit that like button. All those calls to action. Everything you need to know is in the description of this video. And I love y'all. I'll see y'all on Sunday.